mm-hmm. got about uh, 88 <clears throat> participants. So if you're ready and with the permission of the Honorable Vice Chancellor, I would like to start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to Dr. Surya Raghu from ET Cube International and Advanced Fluidics, Maryland, USA. There is an urgent need to instill creativity and innovation in the students, the future of scientists and engineers, the future scientists and engineers who can apply their research and scientific knowledge to address societal or market demands that need scientific and technological solutions. Skills to translate, transform, or extend knowledge from one field or application to another are critical in such endeavors. Entrepreneurial skills imparted to them may also provide a pathway for commercialization of the creative outputs of both faculty and students through startups created for this purpose, thus transforming themselves from employment seekers to employment creators. Upstreaming this should come from policies, updates in our education system and faculty training. Downstream, this could enhance the university's reputation, responsibility, and role in the public good of society. In this presentation, Dr. Raghu will discuss the need for integrating formal training in the concepts of innovation and entrepreneurship into the university's education programs in all faculties, including science, engineering, health, sciences, etc. Dr. Raghu is an extremely distinguished person, um, and his expertise lies in research commercialization, transitioning of ideas and inventions created at research labs into commercial products. He obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering from Yale University and is the founder president of a high-tech company, Advanced Fluidics LLC since 2001 and founding partner ET Cube International since 2013. His earlier affiliations were with Yale University, Technical University of Berlin, Sunny Stony Brooks and Bowles Fluidics Corporation. Dr. Raghu has inventions related to aerospace, automotive consumer, auto, auto, automation, consumer and biotechnology applications, and as he has been awarded 15 United States patents. He has also been a co-director and invited speaker of more than 40 workshops in greater than 20 countries on entrepreneurship, research commercialization, knowledge technology transfer for scientists, engineers, university faculty, technology transfer, official and IP policy committees. Currently, he's also a visiting professor at the Wits University in South Africa. Dr. Dr. Raghu will speak to us on upskilling students for innovation and entrepreneurship, which as all of you know, is the order of the day, considering the changes that are occurring in this country. So over to you, sir, Dr. Raghu. Thank you very much. And I would like to, I would like to also um, formally invite and recognize the presence of our honorable vice chancellor, Dr. Murthy, and uh, the very distinguished professor Natarajan. Thank you, sir. Sorry for interrupting. Problems. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Captain Nagraj Rao. And being in uh, Karnataka, Elarigo Namskara, and good afternoon to you all. Um, thanks to Vice Chancellor uh, Murthy and the Dayanand Sagar University for the invitation. I also want to thank Professor Ramurthy Natarajan, former director of uh, IIT Madras, for connecting me to Professor Murthy, through which this was uh, possible. And as I was mentioning to him, many good things happen by chance. And although we don't rely upon such luck, this time it has, and I'm it's great to be uh, you know experiencing this part being lucky 
With that, <coughs> uh, let me go straight to the topic. I hope you all can see the screen. Can yes, you all sir. see the screen? Yes, please. Okay, great. So the title of the talk is Upskilling Students for Innovation and uh, Entrepreneurship. Now, the perspectives are both for students and faculty. And uh, faculty preparation and student preparation, how we prepare our faculty, how we prepare our students. And the stakeholders are more and mainly also the university administrations, the faculty and the students as well. So we see, or we would like to see incentives on all sides for success of this kind of upskilling in students and innovation. So the outline, I would like to make a case for the need and the changing roles of universities and institutes. I, what I mean is educational institutes. And what are the kind of skill sets we are looking for? And the social aspect of this, the social inclusivity and our awareness of our planet Earth. So what we call SDG, which is Sustainable Development Goals. And then um, some conclusions. So Professor uh, uh, Captain Nagas Rao has already you know, given a brief introduction, but let me tell you a few things that I do. Um, I work in research and product development in aerodynamics and combustion. And lately I've started some work in UAV and drones. The reason I put it in red was kind of relevant to India. I have uh, some interest in doing some work in India on this topic of UAV and drones. I worked in biosensors, medical instrumentation, and work with uh, university labs, almost all the major labs in the United States and the industries, universities in US and abroad for this kind of collaborative work. And as a nonprofit, I have been involved from about 2006 or so in capacity building in uh, several countries, uh, about 25 countries I've worked, I've still been working with them. And uh, training and capacity building in entrepreneurship in developing countries. So these are mainly for scientists and engineers. So that's the you know, uh, audience for us to work on these. And uh, then intellectual property, technology transfer and research commercialization. So. We were consulting experts on that with WIPO, that's the World Intellectual Property Office. And then <clears throat> we also worked under contract on curriculum development in entrepreneurship, online research commercialization tools with the support from, with financial support from WIPO and the Institute of Physics UK which has been a partner for many of the activities. And then also the governments, government institutions also uh, have uh, funded these or have been working with them in several countries. The other part in red is the, um, my work at University of Witwatersrand, also known as WITS for short brief, in South Africa. So we started this program about one and a half years ago to build a innovation policy, starting from innovation policy to having a curriculum, a new course, a postgraduate degree or diploma in innovation for science and engineering majors, mainly those who are going to do their PhD as well. So there are some carrots for them if they continue to go to their PhDs. And then WIC is the 
WITS Innovation Center, which was just opened last month or the month before. So whatever I uh, talk today is the kind of thing I had to convince this university as well to start or pay attention to the needs of the society that is in innovation training and capacity building in innovation and entrepreneurship. So now coming back to India, um, <clears throat> I want to make it relevant to India. And this is the demographics population pyramid in 2020. So that's the re most recent one I could get hold of. So we have a fairly flat bottom, so to say. And uh, the y-axis is the age. And you can see that the majority of the population is young in India. And with uh, the tail going up with very few people, aged people. So we have a great proportion of uh, the population in the young generation. And if you look at the projections though, of what it is for till 2020, our um, <clears throat> population is also going to look different. And the topmost point when the uh, <coughs> Simulation stops is at 2050, and the earliest one was in 1990. So there is a change in demographics. And uh, what you see is also to look from bottom to top, it's a kind of wave that is progressing upwards, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So this wave changes the population demands the dynamics and um, the challenges as well for us. So what we need, the, when this kind of distribution changes, there are more older people as well, the median age increases on this growing population. The population is also increasing. It's supposed to be 1.6 billion by 2030. It's not too far from now. And uh, what we see, or oh, 2050, sorry, it's 1.6 1, 1. billion. And this changing population and grow, growing population as well will demand a lot of local, technical, and science-based innovations to meet the needs of this kind of demographics. Not that we don't have demands now, but it will also change with the time. So to, we need science-based solutions for a lot of the challenges that we have. And also it is projected that <clears throat> we will be adding about 100 million people to the workforce by 2030. So we also have to find jobs or employment or income for this large people, number of people. This is in addition to what we have now, uh, the labor force, another 100 million people added pretty soon. So to these challenges, we need local uh, innovators and we are the best people to solve our problems. So, we need a lot of innovators and entrepreneurs, trained entrepreneurs as well. If people are the wealth of the country, we have the potential to be the richest country in the world pretty soon with this kind of labor force, with this kind of uh, demographics. And you can imagine five times the number of innovators and inventors and entrepreneurs compared to the United States in proportion to the population. We can really do wonders and export all our things to other countries as well. Now, the entrepreneurs, part of the uh, title is the entrepreneurs and uh, the innovators. So if the innovator also turns out to be the entrepreneur, 
it's what I shall call a single dash runner. You know, he takes it from the invention or innovation all the way to the market. On the other hand, there are innovators in their research institutes or educational institutions, and they should also know when to pass on the baton to the entrepreneurs who will take it from there and take their ideas and innovations to the market. So we are doing very well in India with that. Uh, we have made a very great, good beginning. And this is the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, that is the latest one in 2020-21 by the Global Economic Monitor. <clears throat> In all the parameters, this is the spider graph, if I can say so. You can see that we are doing pretty well in uh, the commercial and professional infrastructure, ease of entry, market dynamics, and all these things. So it makes me very jealous. And sometimes I wish I was born 40 years later to be in this kind of environment in India. Not only would my hairstyle be different, but I would also be in such an exciting environment for a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. But if you focus on this shaded part that I'm showing here, our research and development transfer the entrepreneurial education post school and entrepreneurial education at school is kind of on the lower side compared to all the others. The blue line is India and the orange line is the average of 45 countries. These are both developed, developing and less developed countries. So relatively we are doing very good and we need to really increase our emphasis on these three things that we at the university have more control of. Okay. So therefore, we must have more emphasis on innovation, entrepreneurship education and training to kind of pull this graph outwards. And once we do this and the, the feedback effect of this and all the other things will also be very good. So the why am I saying this that I'm saying we when I say we it is the universities and the educational institutions. That's because university is the intellectual capital um, in every country. So we have University, that's the students and faculty, they are the richest source of ideas. They're the brightest minds, most educated, uh, <clears throat> the cream of the society. And not only that, we also have, can influence the society to a larger extent by having what we call the multiplier effect in innovation and um, entrepreneurship entrepreneurial spirit. So <clears throat> the roles of the universities, when I say we have to do all this, we can do at the universities. We also have to acknowledge what's going on in the universities over time. So the roles of the universities from time immemorial, so to say, has been changing. Initially, the educational institutions or universities they began, say, in 1180 or so in training, religion, priests or philosophers. Then, for some reason, lawyers, training lawyers was also important from those days. So we have lawyers, doctors, and teachers. And then it was vocational training to meet the needs of the industry, but vocational training. And then it was helping farmers and industries educational, education and scholarly work followed that. Then was research and in the 1980s began this technology transfer or knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer is the term used in Europe mostly. 
and technology transfer is the word that's used in the United States and Canada too. Oh, sorry. Oh, where am I? All right. So, uh, technology and knowledge transfer began in the 1980s. And later on, what is happening is, or what is evolving is, that the universities are taking an active role in the local ecosystem for social and economic development, or what we call the public good. And what we term as the transformative regional engagement, that is the universities engage with the local uh, town, local uh, communities, local industries, and they all form part of this uh, system. So the last one, that is the active role, also means that we need to produce innovators, entrepreneurs, or job creators as well. And that is what is happening in many systems, many countries. <clears throat> so this is a 20 year old uh, survey <clears throat> that was done. And uh, what I find in many countries, uh, slowly changing, but not fully changed, is that the educational system, and you know, mainly I'm talking about scientists and engineers, I'm sure it is the same in other uh, disciplines as well, is, is rather traditional, which means that they have the regular exams, the old style regular exams, obey, reproduce facts, and then we prepare them for wage employment after finishing their education. So that is not really what the future um, innovators or entrepreneurs need to be, or that, that kind of training is not enough for them to survive or thrive in the world. And they have to be creative and innovative. And our best examples of success stories in the industry should come from those who thrive through our, through our educational system and not those who drop out of the college and become successful. Now, I wish all of them all the luck, but in science and technology innovations, academic training is important and we'd like to see such stories based upon their technical and scientific knowledge. So the impact of research, this is for the faculty and particularly, and people who are trained to be a faculty of researchers. The purpose of the university is public good, and therefore the university's research things as well, the research done by the faculty must have a larger impact than just academic papers. So, We'd like to see all these things benefit to the economy, the culture, the public policy, and so on. And similarly, in terms of products, processes, so the research work that's done by the university must um, be find its way somehow to the uh, society or societal good. And similarly, I'm just quoting here uh, from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers that the research for what purpose? And it's, it's not the idea to produce a lot of data or a lot of papers, but it must have something more than that. And the students as well who are learning in the universities, they will understand the context and significance of their research people who are doing their masters or PhDs, if they find that the research is kind of driven by something that the society needs. But, but that's not enough. The research and innovation to market, um, the perception, unless there is a complete understanding or complete interaction between the universities and industries, 
whatever innovation we bring about may be different than what actually the market needs or what the industry needs. Right? So, for example, I just put in a <coughs> thing that if it is a what we call the self-driven vehicles, there could be in perspective from the what the research we want to do at the university versus what the market needs. And uh, therefore, a lot more interaction is needed than designing a robotic bullock cart for the industry and the society. All right, with that background for research, let me move on to the skill sets that we're looking for in students. So based, um, I want to address the students and say that when I hire people, I'm looking for the kind of skill sets that I'll describe to you all now. And uh, uh, <clears throat> all right, so yeah, so this is the kind of, uh, kind of I want to find out the kind, this kind of skill sets when I interview people. So kind of things are academic background. I want to look at their academic rigor, the things that they have learned and that their entrepreneurial skills as well. In small companies, startups, we want everybody to have these kind of skills. So we look for those kind of things. And those who want to start companies as well, they need to have these entrepreneurial skills. And one thing that is also missing is the innovative skills. It is very few universities teach innovation. It's not a subject to be taught but somehow it has to be imparted to the students. And then we take, they have to also know something about the market or societal needs. And uh, so these are the kind of things in uh, what I call uh, in the academic, I want the academic figure and also interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work and innovative skills, entrepreneurial skills. And the last one, what I call on the right side of the equation is the translatory skills. Everything that they learn here, that they must be able to translate it to the real world uh, for to meet the needs of the you know, market. So there is no substitute for academic rigor they want these students to be learning their science or engineering subjects very well. They must be taught to the fullest scope and uh, fullest level. And uh, then <clears throat> the skills that the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work, this is mostly, yeah, I would say, even for graduate programs, masters or PhD students. I would like them to learn something about working in interdisciplinary fields, that is working with people from different disciplines and be able to appreciate those things. It's not like I know only mechanical engineering and I can only do mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. So I don't want guys to guys coming with the hammer, so to say, only looking for nails. So I want them to be able to use their hammer for other purposes as well, and do something else, um, be able to you know, nail things with some other tool. And then the transdisciplinary part is that they must be able to create a unity of intellectual framework beyond the interdisciplinary perspectives, that is abstraction and generalization of things. And as an example, resonance, limit cycles, nonlinear growth, or chaotic systems, or spectrum analysis. So these are the kind of things that can be translated to many disciplines. And if you're able to translate these things, from one discipline to the other, we can make a lot of progress and be more innovative. 
So that's number one, that is academic background and interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary skill. Then the next part is the innovation. So our focus, it's not innovation downstream, but the upstream, that is you have to be able to innovate right at the time you're doing your research and come up with solutions. I'm talking about technical and uh, scientific solutions. So we are looking for the entrepreneurs take it to the market, but we must have innovative ideas for this. And that's where I think we have a real missing gap in many places. And we would like to uh, focus on this kind of things. So this is learned by a lot of uh, group projects and group activity. And there is no system or very few universities universities or systems where these kind of things are evaluated, taught and evaluated in, uh, in, the, in the regular uh, coursework. So to the new models for innovation is to be interactive with a number of things, what they call the, the triple helix models. So where you have the interdisciplinary work, and then also the government sets the policies and the industry sets or tells us what they need. Industry, I also mean SMEs as well as the markets. Okay. So imagine we are not only talking about fitting all these people into the market, but imagine people having such transdisciplinary backgrounds in all the stakeholders, that is people who can appreciate this in the government, in the industry, that when there is this triple helix interaction, you know, <clears throat> this, the best of the innovation comes out. So not only we want to produce innovators and entrepreneurs, but also those who go to the government, those who go to these industries, or those who go to the academics, we want to prepare all of them to be involved in this kind of activities. Okay. The next one is the entrepreneurial skills. And in the entrepreneurial skills, it is not always about creating a startup or organization, as I mentioned to you. The ability to produce outcomes and being creative opportunity oriented and proactive and innovative and pursue opportunities without regard to the resources you currently control. So I really look for these kind of things when I hire or when I have hired before as well you know, in the companies. So finally, they must also learn to create value. Now, what do we do at the universities for this? So the entrepreneurship education, it is not only about topics, they're sitting and passing an exam, but a way for them to reflect on the process and being graded on the process of learning the skills and mindsets instead of grading the business plan as most of the places do. The process must be graded. And the uh, effective way, as I put here, is to uh, the learning process to a learning law. So in many institutions, entrepreneurship education is about the, is the about approach. That is, what is entrepreneurship and some sort of topics related to that. But their experience, it would be good if a more traditional pedagogy is replaced with a more active uh, mechanism of preparing or educating these entrepreneurs. Now, particularly in science and technology field, it is uh, there sometimes there are two opposite uh, trends. That is the scientist versus the entrepreneur. You have to have a kind of dual personality here and we should somehow try to teach this 
That is, the scientist wants complete data to make decisions. There are some jobs as well which need that kind of thing. The entrepreneur takes incomplete data sets and has to make decisions. So, uh, <clears throat> perfection, the scientist needs perfection. And good enough, I'll give an example. I put a star here. Scientists want to publish. The entrepreneur wants to create value. And in the universities, it's an individual group or hierarchy. In the entrepreneurial world, it's leadership and teamwork. And if you get a three-year project and if you say nothing worked, it's not good. It's to the detriment of a scientist. But the entrepreneur, it's an honor, honor badge, right? So I just want to give an example of this perfection versus good enough. And uh, pulse oximeter, which we are all very familiar with now due to the COVID. So the scientist wants the data, that is the pulse oximeter, to read all the way from 0% uh, concentration to 100% concentration in the blood. But why, you know, is the question by the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur wants only from say 60% oxygen concentration to 100% because anything less than 60, you're already dead. You don't need to worry about the patient. So these are the kind of things, the decisions that uh, we have to, I mean, the dual uh, personalities we must have. On one side, as a scientist, you must have perfection. On the other side, good enough is pretty good for the entrepreneur. The last one is the transferable skills. So these play a very important role in research or student diverse career paths. And the changing trend is what we call the gig work. So a lot of them have to be entrepreneurial and also be able to have these transferable skills. And the recommendation from the OECD is that everybody are stakeholders in this to import this kind of transferable skills to the students. And what are the transferable skills? These are interpersonal skills, teamwork, mentoring, supervising, and so on, organizational skills, research competencies. So it's not just a PhD, but beyond that, something be able to extend it beyond cognitive abilities, communication skills, they you know how to present for a small audience, large audience, public engagement and so on, and enterprise or entrepreneurial skills as well. So these are the four skills that we have to impart to the students and researchers for uh, you know, their success and our success. Now, in addition, we have, as universities and institutes, we have responsibilities towards this, that is sustainability of our planet Earth. And it is not just raising the standard of living everywhere. No, it's, not, it's not affordable to waste like what the Western world does. You know, if that is so, the estimates are that we need five other Earth-like planets to support the Western lifestyle. So it's not, it's not a sustainable solution. So we have to pay attention to these sustainable development goals. I don't want to bore you all with this. Read this. You can look it up in the UN website. And <clears throat> the reason is that ec economy, environment, and society are all important. and so. I put this here as a social inclusion of uh, communities. So uh, let me mention a little bit more about the social inclusion. There was some study done which said that the engineering and design focus in the, in the entire world, 90% of the effort is for the top 10% of the population, that is the wealthiest 10% of the population. This is very disturbing to me as well. Only 10% of the effort is put to the 90% of the population. 
you know, we, we are all guilty in that and we have to do something better than that. And not only, you know, it's, it's not just doing good, but also it's supposed estimated to be around 30 or 40 trillion dollar economy for the 90%, bottom 90% of the uh, pyramid. So we have uh, an opportunity, both economic opportunity as well as moral and ethical responsibility as well. So what is the outcome, the ideal outcome from imparting such knowledge in, uh, to students and researchers? What I look call it as knowledge, skills and abilities. So uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach, entrepreneurship, skills that is practice behavior of all these things are listed. I don't want to read all this and ability. So earlier in those days, it was the aptitude that we are being tested for, but aptitude is not enough. No? They must uh, be able to do that. And there should be evidence of these things um, is what we look for when we you know, look for, when we hire people. All right, so let me circle back to this slide, what I put in here to summarize. So India is doing great. And, you know, we have, we can definitely improve this part of this year, research and development transfer, entrepreneurial education, and entrepreneurial education at school, and also innovation. So we must put in more, um, in a, uh, more effort in imparting these kind of skills to uh, the audience, or uh, to the students. And um, therefore, the, the roles of the universities are changing. It's time for policy updates in the universities and institutes. Create upstream mindset for innovation, that is faculty training and then impart to students. Entrepreneurship education and training, and then update the education system. So these are the main points that uh, I was trying to cover in all this. And I want to conclude with the same title that I meant here, I put it first, the title of my talk, it is Upskilling Students. It involves these things, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary interactions, connection to industry, community and society, town gown relationship, so to say, innovation and transferable skills, and entrepreneurship. So with that, I will conclude and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghu. This is Professor Mohan. Excellent uh, presentation on uh, your work and also uh, how you have uh, uplifted many areas, basically. Uh, so I had a question on uh, government work which you have done. So a lot of work you have done for the government. So any specific work you did for uh, Indian government? No, I've not uh, done any work for the Indian government. Or any other country which you have done any work on the government for the government? Yes, so for um, we did some work for Argentina. Uh, this was for mainly in training uh, technology transfer professionals in Argentina. It was under the invitation of the government of Argentina. And then we had through WIPO, we had, we went through Philippines to build their capacity in technology transfer and research commercialization efforts in Philippines, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. And uh, through the State Department, we also did some work for Pakistan as well um, uh, in uh, their policies. I was in involved in evaluating the proposals, research proposals, and so on. Yeah. So those are the kind of things. And right now, we're also working with the government of Qatar, the Qatar Science Foundation for improving the, again these 
quality of research and innovation in the entire Arab countries. We are doing some work there as well. Thank you, Dr. Raghu. Clarifies. Nant, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. I'm sorry, you are telling me? You can yeah. go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I have, I have multiple questions actually. Uh, first of all, thanks for a very interesting, uh, insightful presentation, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, first is that you talked, uh, talked about transferable skills. Yeah. Right? My question is, is it, uh, uh, in your opinion, do you think, uh, or your experience rather, is it, uh, possible to develop these skills entirely at the college education, university level education. Do you think seed needs to be sown at the school level? Uh, and then related to that, I have another question. I will just throw another question, sir. Yeah. Is the uh, training, because I am also a teacher, a relatively new new teacher. Yeah. But I think, you know, the, the pedagogy is changing from theory to case studies and stuff like that. We are still not at in general, I'm saying maybe there are more stalwarts actually present here who can maybe uh, comment better on this. Uh, education is still not at the innovation level where you know you're talking about out of box thinking. So how much is the need for training the teachers is uh, right uh, at university level also at uh, school levels? Yeah, need for training. Let me answer the first one: the transferable skills. I think we can definitely enrich. I mean, if they can get it, some of these are gotten through in a union high school, for example, high school debating team or science competitions. It gives them all some opportunities, but you know, it is still the undergraduate program and master's is a very formative part of their career where they take it much more seriously, these uh, skills. And I think definitely we can, you know, we, I, we, we cannot guarantee 100% for all the skills to them. They, they will have to, you know, extend it to beyond the college. But at least it must be started in this and provide them opportunities, as many opportunities as possible for, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the college days. For example, let me tell you that even even PhD students, very few are trained to write a proposal. Yeah. It's so unrealistic. I've evaluated at least uh, 200 proposals or maybe more. You know, I see the difference in if somebody, a fresh PhD, if you ask him, or I have interviewed as well, they have no idea what that proposal should be like. <laughs> so in a, in a, through the International Center for Theoretical Physics, we, we are giving out money. This is a small digression, but I have to give this example. So we asked for, uh, we were giving out money, grants for the developing countries and uh, particularly Africa. So we asked them to write proposals for lab equipment. Okay? So we had a request from uh, one professor, 40 laptops. So we asked, can you please justify? And uh, all they said was, yes, we, we need 40 you know, laptops for 40 people. I don't know what you would do with that. This was a scientific proposal. And he just said, uh, yeah, justify, we need 40, you know, and it costs so much. So I think there is much more, you know, we, we must be able to train them in this kind of thing. And communication skills and leadership, and project management and all this, you know, students do learn in some universities they're trained, you know, they, they're asked to plan things for the project. When I was teaching, although it was, you know, thermodynamics was what I was teaching, we still we would, you know, ask them to kind of plan all the way to the semester of the projects. And so I think we can do a little bit. We can definitely start those skills in the university. The second part is need for training of faculty. Yes, there is certainly, you know, there is a lot to be done for faculty training. You know, I all, myself went through quite a bit of training when I was a faculty, as beginning faculty. So in everything, in how to teach, how to communicate, how to interact with students. So I think we can definitely uh, do that. In fact, 
some of the training was only for faculty that we have conducted. Thank you. I sir. hope I answered your question. No, no, I think you, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's, you answered it uh, very well, sir. And uh, that is a highly debated area actually here in, a, in our university too, in a, specifically in, uh, in our department where we are. Yeah. And the captain's leadership, we are constantly thinking of how you impart, you know, better education, which is aligned to the industry and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, we are going through this at uh, our university in South Africa right now, you know, that it's not that, uh, you know, there is a quick buy-in from everybody as well. And if you tell somebody, you know, you got to do transdisciplinary work, you know, university is a place where everybody is very independent. No, that's the yeah. idea of university, <laughs> academic freedom. But uh, then, you know, to nudge them to do something, to something, you know, interactive, it is a challenge. And, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of convincing as well to do kind of activities. So, uh, Dr. Raghu, there is a question from uh, Dr. Amulya Panda. Yeah. And this is the quintessential uh, uh, Practical research versus theoretical research. Yeah. Is that a lot of questions, uh, a lot of research goes into publications and stuff which may not be read by many people and so on yeah. and so forth, as against having research for practical application. Yeah. Um, so, any thoughts? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, let me, that's a very good question. And this is a, you know, uh, common question we do get as well. And uh, <clears throat> studies have shown, it's not just my opinion, but studies have shown that there is really no conflict between uh, either one of them. <clears throat> Theoretical research, practical research, and someday it is a matter of time scale that an extremely theoretical work will become something in the in the will have some applications. And by practical research, if it means applied research, then there are a lot of faculty who can walk through the spectrum very easily from really abstract papers to um, applied work and to patents and innovations. So there is not a big conflict at all. People have published and people have patents as well. And uh, so, um, yes, there is really not much uh, conflict. And um, yeah, it's, sometimes it's a matter of time scale that the really theoretical or abstract work, it takes a while to uh, come into uh, the real practice. Great. Um, so actually, as a while ago, we had Mr. Narayan Murthy and he was saying exactly the same thing that you said. So knowledge for knowledge sake as also knowledge for practical purpose. So this is another question, um, um, Dr. Raghu, in fact, a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, you know, when most organizations try to increase their innovation efforts, <laughs> They always seem to start from the same assumption. We need more ideas. Yeah. They'll start talking about the need to think outside the box or blue sky thinking in order to find few ideas that can turn into a viable new product or systems. Yeah. However, in most organizations, innovation isn't hampered by a lack of ideas, but rather by a lack of noticing a good, the good ideas they already have. So it's a recognition problem rather than an ideation problem. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is indeed a good question. And um, in many universities, uh, many institutions, there is a kind of screening process uh, for these ideas. You know, not all ideas are, uh, go, go, go to the market. It's really less than 0.01% or so 
So it's great. I think we need to have generate lots of ideas and they have to filter through all this criteria to really make something a substantive impact in the market. So it's, it's good to have a lot of ideas and it's, it should also, the faculty or the in, innovators must also be made aware of that all ideas are not going to be go, are not going to go to the market. And there is a systematic way to filter this and we must be able to explain to the innovator why his idea was not, uh, why we did not proceed with that idea beyond a certain point. The problem is the gap between what the societal or market demands are and what the innovative idea is. You know, the example that I showed you, you know, our idea if our idea is, for example, this you know, it is autonomous vehicle is a general term, but if you have an autonomous bullet cart versus autonomous car then you know the market decides which one is going to you know going to survive and sometimes even good ideas yes. you know they don't go the it is not just the idea hello how it is taken to the market also matters sometimes even a b grade idea or innovation when marketed well is more successful than an a grade invention as well so that is the reality of the market. So it's the entire spectrum of activities that the I from idea to the market that's important for the success of the idea itself. Great, sir. So it's the entire, I think the process of uh, innovation and ideation that should come together uh, for commercial success is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, no, and beyond that, beyond that, you know, how it is taken to the market, you know, the entrepreneurs, or transition to the market, the mechanism of commercialization is 90% of the effort than the idea itself. The idea is important, but economically, more than 90% of the effort goes into transitioning that to the market. Nice. Okay. On, on that, Captain, can I ask one question? Just uh, there are a couple yeah. of questions from students, Anand. Uh, okay, sure. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah. So, um, this is there's a question from our executive MBA student, Devapriya Baduri. And he says, we are fortunate with great faculty here at DSU. And thank you, uh, Dev. Um, but every day is a learning curve. It's not going to get you any more assignment marks, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, and he says, how is a student having high entrepreneur desire slash pa passion? We students can associate uh, ourselves, that is he, with projects from developed countries like the USA, maybe initiatives from industry experts in their in those countries and so on and so forth. So generally he wants to know, is there any platform avenue wherein students like this can associate with any kind of short projects and so on in countries, first world countries like the United States? Any thoughts, sir? Um, I don't have any you know, particular way except you know, it is through uh, contacts. But uh, let me make something uh, clear that, um, it's, you know, I think we have to focus. Uh, if I want to have our ideas, it, the chances of you know, somebody with an idea here, taking it all the way to the market somewhere else is much smaller than taking an idea to the market in the local ecosystem. You know, unless it's mainly for advanced, you know, something really so advanced, those are really small. But for the sake of India, we need to find our problems and we need to solve our problems. And we are not wanting to do solve other people's problems, right? So that is a very big problem in many countries. You know, if you ask, you know, this is a real example. We were asked. We were asked some country in some country to design this wash system, water and sanitization, sanitary systems. So they came up with the most sophisticated toilet. You know, everything, Wi-Fi, everything automated, and all those things. And how many people in 
in a developing country with violence. That's part one, you know, the market is really small. The second one is we are much capable of designing what's called resource constrained innovations. And resource constrained innovations does not mean cheap solutions. It's not cheap or low quality. Our quality could be much better than many things that are in the Western countries. So there is no need to you know, really uh, do that or uh, uh, what I would say, you know, cater to the other Western markets. We have the largest markets of India, China, and Africa. They're all going there. They're all coming here. Why are we designing something for them? This is what I tell everyone. But if you want, I think there is a lot of things to learn as well. I, I'm not completely dismissing that. But there are a lot of things you can learn, the innovative spirit and the new way of thinking. You know? We are constrained by our own thoughts many times. And uh, there, are, you know, there are benefits and I don't have any specific way that you can associate with those, uh, those kind of platforms. But maybe you know, we can look for it and maybe we can build something like that, which I'm doing it for the uh, Arab countries right now, you know, interfacing them with uh, you know, Western countries. So I think something like that can be done here as well. Yes, sir. So um, maybe last couple of questions. And uh, you know, today's paper actually has an interesting article on um, the H-1B visa. Uh -huh. And um, they say that, you know, the median salary for H-1B holders, as you know, many of them are from this country, India. Yeah. And uh, it says it's about $105,000 or $108,000, $102,000. Yeah. Um, uh, and that places them at the 90th percentile. That means there are 89% poorer Americans than that. Yes. But if you look at uh, you know tuition in the United States, and that I think India is following along that path, where an engineering master's degree costs something like upwards of one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Do you think it's all getting away from us, and top class education is becoming so expensive that it is unaffordable for most people? And so, where does this innovation and um, uh, uh, the, the ideation itself come from if education is not affordable? Yes, so that is a serious problem in the United States. In the fact, in the last 20 years, we had uh, you know, very few local students there. Um, in my department in mechanical engineering, there are only three American students and about 50 uh, foreign students for, for PhDs. Recruiting local students was a very big problem right at that time. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, it is becoming unaffordable for many of those uh, things. And interestingly, you mentioned about the article, there was another article saying that, oh, recently by the National, I think it's from the National Science Foundation saying that we cannot export our innovation to other countries. I mean, innovative capabilities, we have to build it here. You know, and so there is a new thrust on more funding for innovations, both at universities and small scale industries as well. So, yeah, it is a serious issue. You know, the innovations are coming from everywhere now, particularly after uh, this kind of global connectivity. You don't have to be in uh, any Western country for being innovative. Thank you, sir. Anand, uh, just time for a last question, if you have something. Yeah, I think it got covered, but I mean, I, I, I was just thinking um, more from the information point of view. Uh, uh, sir, how much, uh, since you are in the United States, uh, uh, what percentage of real uh, you know, uh, innovation is coming from universities in US uh, versus the actual industry? Or, or is it kind of university and industry working hand in hand? Well, in India, I think, you know, based on my limited understanding, uh, 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 since we are a third world or maybe second world, there's a thing called second world, 
I mean, there's a lot of lift and shift happening at you, right? So something which is which has already happened in US or any other you know developed country can be easily shifted here, right? So there's a lot of of that happening in India, right? including uh, you know uh, latest things, uh, the startups uh, uh, that have come up, and uh, very little uh, that has come from universities in India. So how much is actually real innovation is coming from universities in India? Uh, in, in the US? Quite a bit. And, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, AUTM report, Associate, Association of University Technology Managers report, they have a long list of you know, innovations that have come up uh, from really, very large impact uh, innovations that have come out from the universities. And, um, the other thing is that the, the, most of these are trained in uh, the universities. Most of the people, innovators, their training, you know, their, their, um, their, their ideas are nurtured in the university and when they get out, they become real good innovators as well. So we need, they do a good job in capacity building for innovators as well there. Um, I don't have the specific numbers, but you know the AUTM report does say that you know um, there is a significant innovation coming out, and the National Science Foundation also has listed in their website itself all the things that have come out from their funding to the universities. So the other point is that. You know, now the terminology has changed. We don't call, you know, anything first world or third world or anything like that, you know. So now it is, uh, uh, you know, they just refer to that in, I think, in terms of um, economics, developing economies or economically developed countries and so on. More polite. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very derogate, you know, say third world or uh, things, you know, they, they, they don't uh, like it. You know, in many countries, they object it to yeah, uh, that's true. people use that uh, word. So, you know, so it is, we just call it uh, developing or yeah. developed economy. It's good, sir. Um, I, we will end there, but before we do, thank you for this fascinating freewheeling discussion. And um, I would really like if you could come down to the university sometime and talk to our faculty. Uh, we have a very interesting program called Faculty Dialogues. Uh -huh. We have educators meeting from across the world, meeting our faculty to exchange ideas. Um, yeah. It's an interesting program. In fact, uh, day after tomorrow, we have the Dean from the business school at the University of Washington coming to speak to our faculty. Yeah. So. Uh, before we end, I would like to invite our honorable uh, vice chancellor. Ask, uh, Captain, sir, we can ask Professor Natarajan, who is in the meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, for Professor. his remarks. Natarajan, yes, sir. sir. Yeah, I'll yeah. sit here for a brief time. First of all, to explain the connection between uh, Suvia Raghu and myself, we are both alumni of the University of Sweetsaria College of Engineers. That was the linking point uh, when we were together in a group trying to help UVCEA. Then we came across each other and then I looked at his CV and it is so impressive. And what we have heard today is the testimony to the rich experience that he has had particularly in the US and also his connection with, for example, South Africa. So that leads me on to one point. I think, uh, Professor Mukti, this probably is an opportunity for UWITS in South Africa and uh, his company, Raghu's company, and your university to come together to take up some issues relating to innovation and entrepreneurship. One of the questions that has bothered uh, faculty members particularly is, can innovation and entrepreneurship be taught? Or conversely, how is it to be learned? There are many people who have diverse opinions on these things. So when, if you say that it is experience rather than expertise, then what type of experiences should the 
academic institution provide to students so that they become fertile in ideation and innovation. The other issue is, uh, unfortunately, the KSA knowledge, skills, and abilities of uh, Surya Raghu, they have not been utilized by this country. But I think for Karnataka, there is an opportunity. Uh, Professor Murthy can probably facilitate this. Professor Murthy, you also know that uh, Ashok Shetter has been given the responsibility of chairing the committee for, uh, uh, for research, development, and innovation policy in Karnataka. You know, this, uh, I, I believe, uh, uh, merges easily with the topic that has been discussed today. So I think we need, we need to connect the two also. The other thing that I would like to point out is, uh, you know, there is uh, one of the questions pointed out that as if uh, the theoretical research and uh, practical or applied research are at opposite ends of uh, the spectrum, which is really a continuous uh, variation uh, or hierarchy of uh, uh, research all the way from blue sky research onto uh, technology, what we used to call technology, the practical applications. Uh, there are merits in pursuing each. One should not uh, uh, try to uh, you know, look at only one aspect of it. And papers are as important as, uh, as products and processes. You also know that the old motto was publish or perish. And now the new motto over the past 20 years in India is patent first, then publish, and then prosper. Why do you have to perish? So these are some of the things that uh, I would like to point out. And also between industry and the institute, it has been said uh, in many conferences that the production of a product, the, the creation of a productive uh, professional is uh, the joint responsibility of industry and institution. Both of us have responsibility for doing this and uh, each should ask what they can bring to the table rather than saying, what is it that you can give to us? So that will definitely uh, succeed. Lastly, I would like to compliment Dayanand Sagar, compliment Professor Murthy, Captain Nagaraj Subrao for organizing this function, organizing this uh, lecture in a very efficient manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, taking time off your uh, busy schedule in Bangalore to uh, give us this lecture. I completely agree with uh, some of the, the points that you mentioned. I think it's necessary. It has to become a culture in most of the institutions. And the institutions also need to uh, awake and start giving this uh, small push, a small uh, uh, space for this innovation and entrepreneurship activities. Thereby, the India can also compete at the global level. Failing which, I think we do lots of things. We do not uh, uh, document anything. And recently, I was just going through the uh, lot of literature uh, regard to the, the inventions in India. But most of them are not patented. I think there's some documentation there. Some of the things are not documented. Over a period of time, the Indian uh, education system need to create that awareness on the people about recording and starting doing things to be in line with the global uh, kind of things. Otherwise, we'll be we'll be left behind. I will not be far behind with what to, what's going to happen. I think some interesting uh, ideas. We will take them uh, forward. At least Dhanan Sagar University under the leadership of Captain, we will take it forward and see what can be done in the future. Create the awareness. I think it's very important. You brought out lots of uh, interesting points for us to consider and uh, implement. I think we will we will take that particular clue and start doing some of those uh, and take those initiatives in the university. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, actually, we uh, we would definitely like to introduce a course on innovation. And maybe you could give us some pointers there. Um, sure, we have to do that. So uh, I want to also thank you all, uh, Professor Natarajan and Professor Murthy and uh, uh, Professor Nagraj Rao, Captain. So thank you so much. It is a great uh, pleasure. And you know, for me, my, uh, my connection to India is much more emotional. 
And uh, you know, this is the kind of things I want to do in the future. I left India as a graduate student. And uh, so after that, I had no connections in professional circles much. And this is the time that I think I can give back to India. And I want to. And anything that I can do, I'll be very happy to do so you know, to all the institutions. So with that, you know, let me hand it over to you. And I really appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to being in touch with you all and see what we can do together. Thank you, sir. And um, thank you to all my colleagues for being here, students, and of course, uh, senior management, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor R. Natarajan, uh, Dr. Parveen from uh, School of Engineering, um, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye.